Hello, hello. It is Celeste here on the Sales Edge podcast. I am with Riley. I'm so excited for him to share his story. I will say he has a storied past that he just shared with me. Connect with him if you want to hear all the details. He started hustling at the in the fourth grade, right, Riley? Fourth grade? Yeah. yeah. Hustling and learning sales before he even knew that's what he was doing. So I'll let Riley introduce himself and we'll get into it. Well, my name is Riley Blaisdell on this platform. I am known as a chubby unicorn, which is the emoji of a rhino. And it was a nickname that my friend's daughter gave me when she was like three years old. And I'm really excited to be here. When Celeste asked, I said yes. So when Celeste asked, say yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so Riley and I met on LinkedIn. I see him all over the place, right? Commenting, sharing, adding insights. So we get to meet in person next week at Saster, and I'm excited for that. I know a couple of my team members have mentioned your name as well. So you're clearly doing something to make a name for yourself, sharing information, education, and value. And I want to... I know we'll get a little bit into your story, but tell us a little bit about your foray into sales before we ask you about your sales edge. So like my introduction to yeah, sales is what yeah. you want to know about. Oh my goodness. I'm the youngest of eight. I come from a very low income family where we didn't have money to provide for certain things. So a lot of the stuff I was getting was hand-me-downs. And so when I was a kid, I found out, you know, like everybody wants candy at school. And so I started buying candy and bringing it to school and I started selling it out of my backpack. And then I built a relationship and I found who the wholesaler was in our area. And I would walk three miles to go do this. And I'd bring the candy back home and I'd pack it and I'd take it into the school and I would sell it. Not only was I selling candy, but I was also selling my friendship at that time uh, to other kids in our school, which sounds pretty darn awful. But, you know, I. I built a business off of it. <laughs> I learned a lot from doing it. I'm sure. Probably others were thinking, this is a budding entrepreneur we have here or budding salesperson. And so you're with Paycor currently. Mm -hmm. And what is your role there? I am an MMSE at Paycor. So I sell payroll and HR software. So if you need to make sure you're paying the most important asset of your business, which are your employees, talk to us. But not only do you want to pay them, but you want to help develop and grow them because at the end of the day, we all need great leadership. So how do you do that? How do you improve your one-on-ones? There's a lot of stuff that we bring to the table that other providers are not. So our tagline is we empower leaders because that's where it starts. And I can, I can say full-heartedly, that I know that I have a great leader that I'm underneath right now. And it is one of the biggest reasons why I chose coming to here. Mm. And this is not an easy industry or market to really learn. But because I have a leader that believes in me, because I have a leader that supports me, when I get distracted by the shiny object, like, oh, my goodness, what about this? He's able to help reel me in and give me guidance. And a great leader is not somebody that demands from you but somebody that mentors, supports, and helps you tap into your full potential. Absolutely. And so it sounds like when we talked earlier about your, your sales edge, right? Like what makes you unique? Mm -hmm. That you are doing the exact same thing, paying it forward, going back, helping other people. Tell us about what sets you apart. What's that sales edge that you exhibit daily? So my sales edge is going to change now. My sales edge is the fact that I don't believe good enough exists, perfect exists. And what I mean by that, I'll actually share a story so we can understand. The last company that I worked for, for nine years, when I first applied, I did three phone interviews. They were like 30 to 40 minutes long. Then I finally got the phone call to come in and do an in-person interview. Went into the office, I met with the sell, the training manager then, then met with the sales manager, then met with the VP of sales, our VP of the organization. And they said, great, we'll get back to you. We'll let you know by Monday what direction we're going to go. And I mean, I spent like four hours there at this office. And I left for the weekend and I was like, man, I'm pumped. I know I'm going to get this offer. 
email comes in on Monday and my heart broke because they said they wanted to go a different direction. And I was so disappointed. So I reached out. I said, I reached out to the training manager, to the sales manager, to the VP of the company, asking for clarification. And I pinned them down. Like I was very persistent. And I got the sales manager on the phone and he was like, look, here's why we passed on you. You took a year off work. We don't have anybody that could do that. I said, well, I worked in the collections industry. It wasn't something that is very healthy. It really kind of ruined who I was as a person. And I needed time to heal to find myself again. Now I'm looking for a career. And they go, okay, great. And I said, I guarantee you, if you give me the opportunity, I will be what Russell Wilson is to Seattle. Now, keep in mind the company that I'm going to work for or trying to get a job offer from is a Seattle-based company. He's a big Seahawks fan. This is 2013, so this is when Russell Wilson was doing really well. And I said, if you guys give me the chance, I will be what Russell Wilson is to Seattle. And that was one of the things that he really loved. He also loved my persistence. And they ended up extending an offer after a while going back and forth. And I ended up getting my chance to work there. And I find it very funny that the year that Russell Wilson is no longer with Seattle is the year that I'm no longer there. And I got laid off from this organization. But you were there nine years, right? <laughs> yeah, I was there for nine years. And I had a large book of business. I was one of the top two, three producers there within the organization. What I remember in my interview, he painted out what he wanted us to accomplish within five years. Mm -hmm. I accomplished what they wanted in five years and two, right? So even the first year when they ended up hiring me on, they had two other people there. My book of business was six times greater than their book of business combined. Wow. And it's because of that chip on my shoulder that mm -hmm. one, I'm never going to be good enough, right? I got to earn it every freaking day. And I'm not going to let up off the gas pedal. And even when I get to that point of like, oh, this is what success is. Success is not that. Success just moved. Mm -hmm. That bar continues to get raised. So I think this is where, I think this is my secret to what makes me, makes me me. Yeah. Well, definitely, you know, that upbringing and having to look at how do I help provide for the family at a young age and probably learn skills and have an education way beyond any formal education at such a young age helps shape you into this consistent drive, right, to accomplish this consistent drive. And it probably goes back to being a competitor as well in sports. Like it's the job's never done, right? A win is just a win, but it's like, what's next? What's next? What's next? And sometimes I find it's hard to relish in the moment, like in the present, because we're secretly thinking like, all right, what's like the next thing and the next thing and that goalpost keeps moving. But it also is, I think you and I were talking about this dedication to being a lifelong learner and giving back to others as well. Because as we talked about off camera, there, everybody has imposter syndrome. Everybody's thinking like, what if I don't fit in? What if I don't belong? Like, what if this isn't good, good enough? Like we're perfectionists. If it's not perfect, I'm not going to do it. And you mentioned that you come in and tell people like, okay, let's take a step back. Like, why does this matter? Why does yeah. this matter? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Like we're always going to have that feeling like we don't belong or we're not good enough. We are our own worst critics. And when we look in the mirror, sometimes we're going to look in it. And we're not going to be happy with what's there. But the story that we tell ourselves mm -hmm. is what really matters. Just because you don't feel like you're good enough doesn't mean you don't deserve to learn. Just because like you feel like you didn't get a traditional education doesn't mean you didn't deserve a spot at the table. Because you have to prove yourself day in, day out. And that piece of paper only matters so much. And... I'm a big believer in education. I just didn't get one the traditional way, but I can thank Brian Tracy for this because I was listening to the psychology of selling 12, 13 years ago, and he's talking about drive time university. And so I ended up taking the time that I spend in my car by myself and I changed it to audibles and podcasts that helped me develop and grow. Now, 
I think at the time he shares a, st a statistic that says most people spend like 40 hours in, in a vehicle, right? And I think it was like a month. Um, think about all that time that you have to learn. Think about that great use of time. Like most people are listening to music. Mm -hmm. So like for me, a treat to listen to music is when other people are in the vehicle with me. But for me, an opportunity to learn is when I'm by myself. And heck, even when I was laid off, and like this is why I'm a huge fan of Jen Allen. My daughter's bath time routine <laughs> was like I would give her her bath in the sink when she was that small. Mm -hmm. And Jen Allen's podcast, Winning the Challenger Cell, was there. And she would have phenomenal guests that would talk about things. And it would get my wheels to turn where I'm like, oh, yeah, I agree with that. Or, oh, shoot, like it would challenge the way I was thinking and be like, oh, wow, there's a different way to go about it. And so I would end up having that time with my daughter and she's listening to this phenomenal listener that's brilliant beyond belief that is really giving me the power to heal because I'm learning. And so I'd give her her bottle. She would fall asleep. That podcast would be going. I'd put her down. You know, I'd go take my shower. I'd be playing that in the background, you know, like. I was just so eager to learn to get better, especially because my goal was to transition into tech. And at the time I was getting rejections where people were like, Hey, sorry, you don't have a degree. Right. Sorry. You don't have a SAS background. And I'm like, dude, like I spent the last nine years doing B2B wholesale <laughs> and I sold a C-suite level. I sold the owners. I also end up knowing how to be a full cycle sales rep because I would hunt and prospect for new business nonstop, and I'd be relentless about that. So even when I had something that happened, like I lost a $500,000 annual account around Christmas, and normally that would end up breaking your paycheck. But because I kept filling the pipeline, kept filling that funnel with constant new opportunities, because people are going to leave you. Even if you do everything 110% right, they're going to leave you. So I didn't feel that blow because I was constantly filling my pipeline and my funnel. And then there's times where I took clients that bought, they started out at a $517 spin annually, and they turned into a four and a half million dollar account wow. after years and years of years of growing it from 500, growing it to 12, growing it to 36, mm -hmm. growing it to 72,000, 378,000, then a four and a half million jump. It doesn't happen overnight. It's just like when we're kids, we don't start walking right away. We fall flat on our face. Like my daughter falls flat on her face constantly and cries and then gets up. And so this is what's the big difference is like, how many times are you going to continue getting up after you fall flat on your face? Are you going to give up because it hurts? And I think failing hurts more. Why not be persistent? I love that. Yeah. And the kid analogy, as you know, I'm right there with you, right? <laughs> Those kids are relentless. They have a goal. Like nothing's stopping them. They will keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. We can all channel that. So thank you so much for talking about your sales edge. Tell us, you've been in sales for a long time. The number one sales myth that you want to bust right now, what would that be? Education, right? You can get a degree. And I'm not against education. It doesn't have to be traditional. Like I've proven to you, like others have taught, there's other ways to challenge channel information. Look at LinkedIn. Every post can probably bring like some sort of nugget to you where you're like, oh, I never thought of it this mm -hmm. way. Right? You want to learn how to sell with your buyers? Nate. Phenomenal. Right? You want to learn how to end up improving your communication. Look at like Samantha McKenna, right? Like there's so many people out there on this platform that are showing there's more than one way to sell and there's more than one way to get an education. I mean, look at like Julia Carter uses a lot of humor, very fun, very relatable, right? There's so many great people on this platform that we can learn from and get better and improve this profession. And it doesn't have to be from a traditional degree, right? 
And so I think what we need to do is find people that are willing to overcome adversity, that have that grit, have that resiliency and that desire to learn and that desire to not allow failure to be something that defines them, but helps them grow. And I think you're going to get the winning piece of something that is going to be missing because you can teach somebody how to do their job. But if you have somebody that is scared of failure, they're going to fail at doing their job. And again, like I'm in an industry where I'm failing constantly. <laughs> Heck, the other day I posted about a cold call where I used an acronym on the phone <laughs> with somebody and they were like, hey, I don't. Oh, what do yeah, you mean? I saw your post, right? And then, <laughs> and then you asked another one and they were still like, I don't know what you're talking about. You yeah. And, and it's because I believe, like, I thought that was like sure. common sense, right? But it's because I'm from out of industry and I'm learning this stuff. And it was something where I was like, you know, when I sold disposable gloves, I never called somebody up and was like, hey, do you got the guan, which was like an orange glove? Like, nobody knew what that was. <laughs> Right. Like, that's not how I spoke. Right. And so it was a it was an awakening for me. And I actually sent an email back to this lady and I said, hey, like, I cold called you. I said this, this and this. You told me this. I wanted to really thank you for giving me that, like, yeah. perspective of like that awakening, that uh, aha moment of. Like, use use common language. And I say this all the time to people. I'm like, explain it to me like I'm five because I love that Michael Scott <laughs> gif. It's like one of my favorite gifts. Like, explain it to me like I'm five. You know, and that's what that's what we need to do. We need to get rid of these buzzwords, right? Like, truthfully, like it makes us sound smart when I'm like, oh yeah, seamless integration. Right. Man, there was a time, and my manager even told me this. He was like, when I when I first when we finished our first fiscal. He was like, dude, there was a time you couldn't even spell HCM. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't wrong. Like, I'm still drinking from a fire hose and I'm still trying to tread water and I'm still learning. The difference is that, like, I'm not going to give up. Like, failure is not an option. The only option is success. And so I'm going to find ways to continue to develop, continue to learn. And there's people that I'm going to engage with and ask for time on their calendar to help giving me a review or oversight on how to continue to get better in this space. And I'm going to do the basics really well, right? I'm going to seek to understand. I'm going to learn to what the real true problem is. And I'm going to understand, is it, is it the right time for them to make this move? Or am I just trying to sell because I have a quota to hit? Yeah. And if I'm trying to sell because I have a quota to hit and you get that commission breath, I'm doing it wrong. Commission breath. Right. Like, yeah, I think yeah. what we need to do is focus on being of service. Right. Where we need to focus on. Can I really help you solve that problem and other problems are going to occur because your business is at this size. And eventually when you get to this next step in that business, you're going to approach this hurdle, this hurdle, this hurdle. But if you get it put in place now. By the time you get there. You're going to bypass all that stuff. You're going to allow more growth to happen. So understanding how you can be of service by taking the time to listen to others on the other end and what they really need and being confident enough to point them in a different direction of something. Great example right now is I had somebody that was asking about our options that we have. And they said that they wanted to come off a competitor of ours, which offers a PEO model. So I interpreted it that they wanted to get a benefits provider. So I made an introduction and their response was like, hey, thanks for the introduction. You know, really appreciate it. But we're not looking at going from a PEO model. We really want that. So not only did I own my mistake for missing that. I also asked for clarification on yeah. it. But I know that I have somebody that I have in my network that does this for a living. Great. The business wants a PEO. So why am I not going to point them in the right direction? So I already reached out to my friend. And I'm going to make that introduction for them because that's what they want. 
Yep. And well, that's my job. Being, being of service and being of value. Mm -hmm. And I loved how, you know, you talk about, I think there is this myth out there that salespeople or, you know, you're in the tech industry, you have to have this. And we're, we're evolving. If anything, TikTok, influencer marketing, anything has shown us people can come out of the woodworks and have a specific set of skills or have the will and desire to learn. And they don't have that formal background or benchmark that most companies are looking for people to be within this box. Once we start expanding that box, I was a great example of it. My first position um, as a director managing people, I'd never managed anybody before. I hadn't worked in the industry, couldn't tell you anything about it. And I got a job managing five people. And they said, this was the first time that our company has gone outside of our box, which is you had to come from within the industry and you already have had to have, you know, been a manager before. And here I was in a director level. And I think it paved the way for them to open up their eyes to see great people don't come from the box that we have arbitrarily set. So I love that you shared that about, you know, non-traditional paths that people come across. I interviewed Alex Christian last week. He was a freaking commercial pilot, right? And he is now an account executive. Like it, it, there are so many parallels, but he had to paint the picture just like you are having to do, you know, you had to do with that first job and also helping others to do the same. So I truly appreciate you sharing your story. I like to keep this brief because then now people don't have all day to sit and listen to a podcast, but I loved what you shared. I hope others will reach out to you and hear like your behind the scenes story, right? That grit, keep following you. You're dropping amazing real life content about the day in the life of sales flubs, right? What it's like to be in the sales seat, but also really, truly being this lifelong learner and passing it forward to others. I truly appreciate your time and I can't wait to meet you in person at Saster. Me too. I'm looking forward to it, Celeste. All right. Take care, Riley. Thanks so much. You have a good one.